Move over Bridgerton, there's a new costume drama in town. The Gilded Age is an American series created and written by Julian Fellows for HBO. In season one, the show is set in 1882 New York. The costumes are designed by Kasia Weleke Maimone. Sorry if I butchered her name. She's a very established designer for both stage and screen, having worked on a lot of my favorite movies, Ready Player One, The Adjustment Bureau, Bridge of Spies, Moneyball, and Wes Anderson's Moonrise Kingdom. She has multiple costume nominations, but no wins, but I have a feeling that things will soon change. Before we get to the review, there will be some spoilers for all season one of The Gilded Age. In the show, creator Julian Fellows borrows heavily from his past works like Downton Abbey and one of my favorite shows of all time, Upstairs Downstairs. I found some of the tropes a bit of a yawner, like the opportunistic lady's maid who has her sights set on Mr. Russell. And it was a challenge to root for the show's chief female protagonist and possible villain, Bertha Russell, who doesn't give a crap about anyone other than her family's ability to climb the social ladder. Let's hope we see an arc for her in season two, which has already been announced. Now, aside from all of this, there is some fun to be had. And once I got into the rhythm of the show, I thought it was a grand old time. The character I liked the most was Aunt Agnes, played by the marvelous Christine Baranski. While steeped in the old ways, she's the moral compass for the show. I've read that the Russell family was inspired by the Vanderbilts, and George Russell, the family patriarch, is likely based upon Jason Gould, an American railroad magnate and financial speculator, but also a very unpopular figure in real life. The Gilded Age production describes him as a classic robber baron. In many ways, the Gilded Age is a reflection of modern-day America. From 1860 to 1900, the wealthiest 2% of American households owned more than a third of the nation's wealth, while the top 10% owned roughly three quarters of it. While the main cast portrays fictional characters, many of the supporting characters are based upon real-life people like Clara Barton, the founder of the American Red Cross, American socialite Mamie Fish, Caroline Astor and her daughter Carrie Astor, and Ward McAllister. The period drama show The Alienist also included real-life figures. Now let's talk about the costumes. Like Downton Abbey or Bridgerton, it's ensemble heavy and many of the principal characters have dozens of costumes. While I was sorting through the show's images, I kept finding new costumes. My initial reaction to the costumes in the show was a little more visceral, but like many things, once I took a step back, my reaction softened somewhat. While I haven't dug into it too deeply, I tend to stay away from all of that drama when I can help myself. I believe that the historians will likely have their knickers in a twist over some of the choices. If you've visited my channel before, you likely will know that historical accuracy isn't as important to me as long as the costumes serve the story and the characters. Erica Armstrong Dunbar, the show's historical consultant and co-executive producer, tells the Smithsonian, The clothing that our actors are wearing, the carriages that they're stepping into, the teacups that they are using, all of this is accurate. I think it's a little disingenuous to make this statement since there are many liberties taken in the costumes, especially when it comes to the incorrect silhouette and at times the draping and color combinations that push the boundaries. So to be fair to the show, we are dealing with actors with modern bodies Many of them have never worn late 19th century underpinnings, so we cannot possibly expect their silhouette to be 100% accurate. And allowances have to be made. Carrie Coon, for instance, who played Bertha, was pregnant while shooting. If you look closely, you can see that she is often draped and caped as the season progresses. Vogue says that for comfort, the actors wore modern underwear, and you can indeed see that in this behind-the-scenes picture of a pregnant coon eating a slice of pizza. Louisa Jacobson, who plays ingenue Marion Brooke, by the way, did you know that she's Meryl Streep's daughter? Had a tough go with her corset. She told Vogue, in the beginning, during fittings with our costume designer, I got a little bit carried away. I had this idea that I would have a really snatched waist in every scene. After a couple of months, I had to go back to her and be like, I'm really sorry, but we've got to loosen this puppy up. I couldn't sleep on my side because my ribs were so sore. 
Pasha told Fashionista, We did faithful research of that period and studied in detail the American fashions of 10, 15 years before 1882 and fashion that followed 1882. That period was very experimental in the draping, use of color, and shapes of garments and hats. I don't doubt that the designer and her team were aiming for accuracy, but then veered off because in the same interview she said, to enjoy some creative license, and it's a bit embellished as any film material needs to do for the sake of storytelling. Story-wise, I understand why we have this tremendous juxtaposition between the new money and the old. I get it. It's just at times I found it heavy-handed, and I didn't like what I saw because for me, it pulled me out of the story. I don't want to dump on the design team because I can only imagine the amount of work that went into season one with 5,000 handcrafted costumes brought to the small screen. So, before I get into any negative opinions, let me tell you what I do like, and then you can make your escape through the downstairs exit or the front door if you prefer. For starters, I liked all of the servant uniforms in both houses. I thought they were excellent, and I liked the men's costumes as well. During the day, the men of wealth are always smartly dressed in dark frock coats and waistcoats, wearing starched and pressed crisp white shirts, dual tone cravats fastened with pins, beaver silk top hats, and they're all carrying canes. Their white tie and tail evening looks were also dashing. The men's costumes were purposefully understated to allow the women's costumes to catch the eye, a request made by the show's producer. Kasha said, we agreed with Julian, that's how we're going to approach the men. We were very conservative with men. They were going to be this solid, elegant, measured giant palette for women to shine. With his bit of flair, Nathan Lane's Ward McAllister ensembles were my favorite men's costumes. The other costumes that I like are the Newport by the Sea outfits worn by both the men and women, like we see on Oscar, Carrie, and Larry, with their nautical touches of navy and white and some burgundy thrown in for a nice bit of additional color. Oscar's straw Hamburg, while I don't know if it's historically accurate, I thought it worked for his character. Some of the images appeared to be inspired by the great French painters of the time, like this one side-by-side comparison of Bertha Russell and this James Tissot 1874 painting. You can see some of the influence in the polonaise style draping of Aurora Fane's dress, which is just gorgeous. Carrie Astor's black and white gown worn at the Newport dinner was easily one of my favorite costumes in the show. And I like most of the Society Ladies' costumes. My favorite amongst those were Aurora Fane and social outcast Sylvia Chamberlain. The way they styled actor Jean Triplehorn as Chamberlain reminded me of an older Gigi played in the film by Leslie Caron. But the costumes that I love the most are the sisters Ada Brooks and Agnes Van Ryn. Yes, they are the most period correct, and they have an almost flawless silhouette. I will overlook the fact that Agnes isn't wearing a corset cover during one dressing scene. The fabrics and constructions of the gowns are beautiful and show their wealth and stature while still not being too ostentatious. They are not showy in the least. That would be tacky. Agnes's jewel tone gowns are created from sumptuous silk brocades and taffetas trimmed with exquisite lace trims, jet bead fringe, and beaded appliques. Kasia stated that most fabrics were sourced from Rome, Paris, or London, or created in the show's costume house. You can see the influences from many of the historical 1880s dresses of the period from the McCord Museum and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. While we do see a repeat or two with Bertha, the sisters will wear an outfit more than once. They are all good pieces and a huge investment, so it only makes sense that these quality garments would be seen on more than one occasion. Kasha said, We knew that Ada would have the oranges, browns, and greens as somebody who's like a librarian and missionary on a journey to discover charities and be part of the society. I like how Ada has these masculine elements, a style borrowed from men's military jackets at the time, because Ada is much stronger than her sister gives her credit for. I just want to take a moment to say that if you're enjoying this content, please consider subscribing. For Peggy Scott's plaid dresses, Kasia told Fashionista 
that she took plaids from a lot of research. For example, this circa 1893 quarter length portrait of an elderly lady in plaid dress by photographer C.L. Kempf from Brooklyn, New York. She said, we use the plaids more in the home environments. Then we tried to stay away from the plaids because that was just the beginning of her character arc. We moved to things that were a little bit more professional, like the stripes and browns. There are a lot of existing plaid gowns from the era, like these two dresses, one from the Museum at Fit and this 1882 French dress from the Met. I liked many of Marion Brooks' costumes, like some of her afternoon and evening gowns. The costume designer described the character's style as a mix of old money and new money, with Marion favoring pastel yellows and blues, lighter fabrics, lace, and floral prints. Some of her sunny yellow dresses were my favorite. The one she wears when she's meeting Rakes looks like something out of a musical. Maybe that's an homage to the fact that there are so many in the cast that hail from Broadway. Again, Tissot paints women in these softer shades of yellows, blues, and pinks. Marion's ball gown in the season finale was stunning and reminded me of a particular French Impressionist painting that I can't find, so if you know, please let me know in the comments. This is likely a minor grievance, but Aunt Agnes bought her a lot of clothes, which seems at odds to me when her aunt took her in because she was nearly penniless. But more importantly, the silhouette on some of Marion's looks felt way too contemporary for my liking, like 20 years in the future. In the beginning, they forewent the bum roll and bustle altogether, and at times she had this ridge just below her bust that was like driving me to distraction, like there was a dent in her corset or something. I should mention at this point that the busk was worn at the front of the corset to provide the stiffness at the center front of the corset. Here's where I take a darker turn in this video. Sorry, but it can't be helped. There was this one look that was so awful. The blue lace collar and gold satin number. There was even a scene where she was with Aunt Ada dressed in a bright royal blue where they clashed. The designer admits, I might have pushed it too far here and there, but I also think that what happens when young people are trying to define their style. Now, I'm going to mention, I do like it when designers are going for it, but this for me was just too much. Marion is a veritable Marjorie Tyrell of New York. The use of gold, bronze, yellow silk satin kept popping up in so many costumes that I started to get a migraine. Yellow ochre worked great on Ada because it was in her color palette, and it would be one thing if it kept it to one character, but it would pop up on Bertha and then Peggy Scott as well. Dorothy Scott's costumes, especially that yellow two-piece day suit, was so bad with that trim on the front of her bodice. It was really unflattering on Audra McDonald. I also didn't like many of Caroline Astor's costumes. The brocade fabrics had this weightiness to them akin to upholstery fabrics. For the ball, her gown with the broad lace trim looked hastily put together like her character had to pull out all the stops to make an appearance. Maybe that's what they were going for. Okay, let's get to Bertha Russell. Something that I learned after I finished watching the show is that Carrie Coon was a late replacement for Amanda Peet who had to leave the show due to a scheduling conflict. The design team switched directions when they met Kuhn, and their design was informed by the way she walked and sashayed around the room. According to Insider, Bertha's gowns took on more metallic hues that Kuhn said were a nod to America's industrialization and the Russell's monopolistic fortune built from railroads. Her design was the most ambitious and created to make a statement. So I have mixed feelings about her costumes because some of them I genuinely like, but others I hated. On some of them, the draping was way over the top and the combination of colors and fabrics clashed. Yes, my opinion is very subjective and you can choose to disagree with me on this. But if you look at some of the great French design houses of all time, like the House of Worth, they had years of training in their craft, working with a variety of fabric manipulations and techniques. All you have to do is look at any historical gown from the 1880s, and you'll see what I mean. There is balance, there is symmetry. In this case, the design team are attempting to recreate their own versions of these costumes, but with much tighter deadlines and obviously with like a a smaller budget. It's the same way that a master chef with a recipe will create a dish that is unrivaled, but if a home cook attempted the same recipe, it might not work out. 
And finally, I have just one more character to poo-poo, and that's poor Gladys Russell. I understand where they were going with this, like the doll's tea party, which was hilarious, says it all. Gladys's mother won't allow Gladys to come out into society, so she dresses her like a child. Many of her outfits have an 18th century silhouette, which actually isn't inaccurate because this period did take influence from that period. It's not that, it's just that many of them look so bad on the actor. So at first I thought she was meant to be a sickly character because the pale costumes drained all of the color from her. I'll make an exception though with this white and yellow number. It was really pretty. And her hair, while historically accurate, was so mousy. Perhaps they are going with this ugly duckling to a swan trope. And in season two, we will see a great transformation. Let me know what you thought of the costumes in the comments. Did you love them? Did you hate them? I have a live stream coming up on Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern with Tony Teflon. We'll be doing a deep dive into the Gilded Age. So I'll leave a link for that in the description below. I hope you can join us then. 